This lecture is about colligative properties, and that is property that is unique to solutions. A colligative property is any type of property that depends on the number of solute particles dissolved in the solution. A colligative property makes no difference, doesn't matter to the solution what the solute is, simply the number of particles dissolving that solute creates. So the colligative properties that we're going to focus on, vapor pressure lowering, boiling point elevation, melting point depression, and then osmotic pressure. I want to just take a minute. If you look at these two, you can tell by adding a solute, it is takes more energy to boil, right? That would explain both of those. Oops. And so, actually, that's why antifreeze works. It actually opens up the operating window like crazy. So imagine that you only had water in your car radiator. And so then as soon as it got to be 100 degrees, um, it, it wouldn't be able to function anymore, right? Because all the water in your radiator would boil off. And then if it got below zero degrees, it would freeze and it would not be functional, right? So the idea is to keep the operating temperature of your vehicle in between zero and 100. So we add antifreeze, and guess what that does? That elevates the boiling point, and it's a colligative effect. So let's just make up a number. Depends on how much of it you add, but we're gonna say it raises the boiling point of water to 110, and then it lowers the freezing point, we'll say to minus 10. And again, it depends on how much. But by adding antifreeze, or really any non-volatile solute, you have opened up the operating window of your vehicle. So one of the laws um, that quantitates this colligative effect is Routh's Law. It looks kind of similar to Dalton's Law, right? And that you, except we're talking about vapor pressure now, instead of pure pressure from a gas. So again, vapor pressure is, if you're talking about a, some type of liquid, vapor pressure is the pressure due to the particles of the li liquid that have escaped from the surface of the liquid into the vapor phase, and it is those particles that create vapor pressure. So Routh's Law says the total vapor pressure of a solution is kind of like Dalton's Law said, <clears throat> pressure from each volatile component of the solution. Now, if there's a non-volatile component of the solution, it is not going to contribute to the vapor pressure. So this is only for volatile components of a solution, which is typically the solvent, right? Like even water is volatile. Any, any liquid that you leave out for, you know, not for years, but for a day or days, and it evaporates, that has some volatility. So <clears throat> X, as always, is the mole fraction of that volatile component. And P is the vapor pressure of that component in its um, pure state. So what happens, what is Routh's Law saying? Um, it's basically saying that the vapor pressure of a solution is only going to be a fraction of what it would be if it was the pure solvent. So here's an example. This is an example where we have two volatile components. There is a solution of benzene and toluene. Um, I wouldn't expect you to write off the top of your head and know they're, they're volatile that they create vapor pressure, but if you read the question carefully, you should be able to tell they are because they give us the vapor pressure of both of them. Okay, there's benzene, there's toluene. So that goes to show you then um, that you've got to calculate the contribution of the vapor pressure from each of those two components. So using Routh's Law, which tells us the vapor pressure of the solution is the mole fraction of each 
component times the vapor pressure of that component when it's pure. Um, so we need to find the mole fraction of each component. Well, they gave us the mole fraction of benzene, but of course all mole fractions add up to be one, right? So if there's only two components in this solution and one of them is 0.6, that means the other one has to have a mole fraction of 0.4. So now we can find the partial contribution of the vapor pressure from each of the components because we know the mole fraction of each and then we simply multiply that by the given vapor pressure of that component when it's pure. So here are the partial pressures contributed by each of the two components of the solution. And then to get the total vapor pressure, we simply add them together. Pretty easy. Most of the time, there will only be one volatile part of a solution, and that will be the solvent itself. And so you're most likely to, likely to encounter Routh's Law, um, like I said, with only one volatile component. So let's just say salt water, right? That's, that's real common. So the only volatile component in that would be water, and salt, which is a solid, just like any solid, okay, is non-volatile. So it's not going to contribute to the vapor pressure of that solution. So it's just left out of Routh's Law, okay? So again, in this case, if there's only one volatile component, then the vapor pressure of the solution is simply going to be the mole fraction of the solvent times the vapor pressure of that solvent when it is pure. And in all cases like this, where you have a volatile solvent with a non-volatile solute, the vapor pressure of the solution will be lower than it was as the pure solvent. So if, if you look back to the first slide in this PowerPoint, one of the common colligative effects is vapor pressure lowering. The reason that a non-volatile solute lowers the vapor pressure of a solution, you can think of the solute molecules, which are the blue spheres here, is simply blocking the way for as many of the solvent molecules to escape into the vapor phase as normally would. So th these represent water. And again, to get into the vapor phase, any liquid, um, the molecules of any volatile liquid at the surface, some of them, a certain portion of them, are going to escape into the gas phase at, at any, any one point. And if you have non-volatile things that don't evaporate, that don't vaporize, vaporize easily, blocking some of them, that rate of escape into the gas phase is going to slow down. And so the overall vapor pressure is going to be less. And that is what happened. And it turns out that the more non-volatile the solute is, the lower the vapor pressure will be. Or the more of it you add, the lower the vapor pressure will be. Um, again, as with any colligative property, the identity of the solute doesn't matter. All that matters is how many particles of the solute there are present in the solution. So here's another example with Routh's Law. Um, all right, let's see. So here they give us sucrose is the solute and it is non-volatile. Okay, that's just table sugar. It's a solid, right? Um, let's see, and here's its that we'll be able to get mole fraction from the percent by mass. They're asking us for the vapor pressure of the solution. Okay. Now, listen to me really carefully here. In Routh's Law, you want the mole fraction of the volatile substance, which in most cases will be the solvent itself. You do not want the mole fraction of the solute, okay? It's not volatile. All right, and times the pressure of the solvent or whatever the, vo the um, volatile component is. Alrighty, 
So probably the trickiest part in these routes law is just going to be getting to the mole fraction. So let that. All right, so what does 66% by mass mean? That means that there are 66 grams of the solute, in this case is sucrose, for every 100 grams of solution. All right, so the, if there are 66 grams of sucrose in every 100 grams of solution, there are 34 grams of water in every 100 grams of solution, right? So now that we have grams of each component, we can figure out the moles of each just by dividing by the molar mass. So there are the moles of sucrose, there are the moles of water. Remember, it is the mole fraction of the solvent that we want. So mole fraction is always moles of what you're interested in divided by total moles. Here is the mole fraction of uh, water in the solution. Now, since the solvent is, by definition, the major component of any solution, uh, the mole fraction you get for Ralph's Law is always going to be a large number. It's always going to be closer to 1 okay, than 0. All right, so now we can go ahead and plug into Ralph's Law. Here's the mole fraction of water in the solution. And this needs to be given to you, which I realized a bit ago I didn't give it to you. But this is the vapor pressure of water when it is pure at the temperature, whatever temperature. Um, well, that's the boiling point of water. So obviously we know that the boiling point of water, um, the definition of boiling point is when the um, vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. But um, don't worry about that so much now. So we've talked about lowering of the vapor pressure as a colligative effect by adding a solute. And as I mentioned in the introductory slide, um, another colligative effect is boiling point elevation. And so that means whatever the boiling point was for the pure solvent, so if we're talking about water, it'd be 100 degrees. Once you add a non-volatile solute, the boiling point is going to elevate or increase. And that's useful. That's, what, that's actually one of the reasons we add salt to water when we're cooking food. Um, because now, let's say we add enough salt so that the boiling point of water is 110. Guess what? Our food's going to cook at a higher temperature and cook faster. Of course, salt is flavoring too. But anyway, I kind of like this. We've learned about phase diagrams in this unit too. So the phase diagram, or the solid lines, represent the um, regular standard phase diagram of pure water. And um, they're just showing you what happens when you add a solute. Okay, so remember this is the melting line. And just a reminder, melting and freezing are the same value. They're just going, approaching it from opposite Direction. So I could say freezing line as well as I said melting line. Um, but of course, we know that typically uh, for water, um, that at one atmosphere, so here's one atmosphere. And so we know normally the freezing point of water is zero, right? Once we add a solute, okay, the new freezing point is lower. So just make up a number, minus 10. All right, and then the boiling point is higher. So if you were to find the regular boiling point on a phase diagram, right? So you go to one atmosphere, which is atmospheric pressure, uh, go over the regular boiling point till it hits the boiling line. The second line is the boiling or condensing line, right? Depending on what direction you're approaching it from. Drop down, so we know the boiling point, the normal boiling point of water is 100. Once you add a solvent, solute, sorry, the boiling point goes up. We'll just guess, 110. So we can um, quantify the difference in the freezing point or boiling point of a substance by using this equation. So this set tells us that the difference in the boiling point, and there's one on the next slide you'll see for the freezing point, is... Uh, the boiling point elevation constant, which must be given to you. Now, here's a new term for most of you. This is called molality. Okay, 
Okay, this is not molarity. Okay, so molarity <clears throat> is moles per liter of solution, right? Worked with that. Molality is moles, the numerator is the same, moles of solute. The denominator, however, is kilograms of solvent only. So you need to calculate molality to be able to calculate boiling point elevation or freezing point depression. So this is very similar to the last slide. Same formula, but the constant is different. Okay, so the freezing point constant, it's unique to a particular solvent. Um, you have to be given it, but the freezing point constant is different than the boiling point constant, so be careful. But other than that, it is the same. So here are the two formulas again. A word about this little i. That is called the Van Hoff factor. Now, if the solute is a covalently bonded compound, i is one. If I is one, that formula simplifies to simply molality times the constant you're given. So how do you know if a solute is covalent? So just a reminder here, covalents are two or more nonmetals, right? So things like sugar, glucose, or sucrose, right, are covalent. They're all nonmetals. Okay, so any covalent compound at all, and this is what you use. If you have an ionic compound, I is not one. Okay, I is greater than one if you have ionic, and I'm going to explain why. You may remember in the first slide, with the definition of colligative, I said that it depends on the number of solute particles dissolved. Well, if, do you remember what happens to an ionic compound when it dissolves in water? The first thing it does dissociates into the cation and anion. So now, for every one um, formula unit of sodium chloride we dissolve in water, how many particles do we get? We get, whoops, we get one sodium cat. Goodness, it's not behaving. One sodium cation and one chloride anion. So we have two particles and I is two. So it's very important to take into account the Van Hoff factor in one of these. Real quickly, what would the I value be for something like calcium chloride when you dissolve it in water? Well, you're gonna get one calcium, right? But look at this, it's gonna dissociate into two chloride ions. So for calcium chloride, I is three. You get three particles for every one calcium chloride you dissolve. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with down here, but I grew up in Michigan, and it snows a ton, icy roads. And so the ice lane trucks are out on the roads all the time. And what they drop is calcium chloride. They do not use sodium chloride. And the reason being is the I factor. They get more bang for their buck for calcium chloride. It has a larger impact on lowering the freezing point of the ice on the roads so that it doesn't freeze at zero. It doesn't freeze until it gets to minus 10, for example. So let's say that you're comparing the colligative effect of sodium chloride to calcium chloride. It depends the extent of the change or the magnitude of the change in temperature on either the boiling point or freezing point. Remember the formula depends on molality, the concentration, and then constant, which isn't gonna change, right? And then on the I factor. So basically the two variables that can change the effect on the freezing or boiling point are molality and the I factor. So for example, if you're talking about a 0.1 molal NaCl solution, you're basically, so there's the molality, 0.1. The I factor for sodium chloride is gonna be two. 
So the effect on the change in temperature is going to be 0.2 for sodium chloride. So what is it going to be for calcium chloride? Well, if we have the same concentration of calcium chloride, so let's just say we have 0.1 calcium chloride solution, what is the temperature effect on that? It's going to be molality again, which is 0.1, same as it was for sodium chloride, but now the I is going to be 3, so the total effect is going to be 0.3. Okay, so it's going to be a larger effect than it was for sodium chloride. All right, let's go over calculating molality. It's so easy to mix that up with molarity. I don't know why they had to even give it a name that's so similar. Well, molality is abbreviated with a lowercase m, and molarity is a larger case m, so just be aware of that also. And again, molality is the moles of solute. It's the same for molarity, so that the numerator is the same. But now, remember, molarity is liters of the entire solution, so it's the volume of the entire solution, whereas molality is independent of the volume of the solution. It simply is the mass of the solvent in kilograms. <clears throat> and the reason they use molality is it's not, the molality will not change with temperature. Surprisingly enough, molarity, because it has a volume term, can change with temperature. So if you have extreme temperatures, um, your molarity can actually change a bit. So since the whole point of colligative properties is high and low temperatures, you're affecting boiling points and freezing points, um, you want a concentration value that does not change at all with temperature. Alrighty, let's do a sample problem. What is the new freezing point of a solution? So ethylene glycol happens to be, that's what we use for antifreeze. So here they are, giving you the quantity of the solute. Now remember, to get molality, you also need quantity of the solvent, right? So there's all the information. We're talking about freezing points, so we want the freezing point constant. Be careful, because some questions will give you freezing and boiling point constants. Get the right one. All right, so the first thing we do, I don't know if you hear the rain in the background. It is pouring here, and I have a, a metal roof. Um, okay, so molality, moles of solute, okay, 478 grams of ethylene glycol, um, the molar mass of ethylene glycol, so this is my moles of solute, and molality is divided by kilograms of solvent, so of course you will typically have to convert the grams given to kilograms, so remember how to do that. There are a thousand grams and one kilogram. All right, so we get that the solution is 2.41 mol. We say molal. That's usually what it molal. All right, now that we have that, we can go ahead and plug into the equation to find the difference in the freezing point. They gave us the constant value. Here's the molal that we just calculated. So the difference in temperature is going to be 4.48 degrees. Be very, so listen to me very carefully. Be very, very careful and remember that you have only calculated the difference in temperature. Go back to the question. It rarely asks you for the difference in temperature. It typically says, what is the new freezing point or what is the new boiling point? So you know the normal freezing point of water. What is it, right? Zero degrees C is the freezing point of pure water. If it changed by 4.48 degrees, then the new freezing point, because we know it's freezing point depression, right? Freezing points always go lower when you add a solute. So the new freezing point of water, or of this solution with water and ethylene glycol, is minus 4.48. Now, if this question also asked for the boiling point of this solution, what would we do differently? OK, 
Okay, we would first of all use the boiling point constant instead of the freezing point constant, and then multiply that by the molality. Now remember, once again, you're getting the change in temperature. So let's say we did this for water and we got 6.51 degrees as the change in temperature. What would be the new boiling point? So remember, it's boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. Boiling points get higher, freezing points get lower. So whatever you get for the change in temperature for boiling, you would add it onto the normal boiling. So we know water boils at 100. We would add the change in temperature we just calculated. So the new boiling point would be, in this case that I'm making up, 106.51 degrees. All right, the last uh, colligative property we're gonna talk about, and that's osmotic pressure. It turns out, and it's actually basically for statistical reasons, and the body, a lot of parts of the body work this way, where you have a semi-permeable membrane that has pores in it that are small enough to allow um, pure solvent to pass through, small solvent molecules. So solvent can pass both ways, but solute molecules um, cannot pass. So let's just say we had sugar, glucose dissolved, and those are too big and they get stuck in the semi-permeable membrane. And so there is a natural drive. You're gonna have water going back and forth, but what you're gonna end up with when you reach the equilibrium state is a, a lot of the pure water is going to be essentially stuck over um, on the side with solute in it in an attempt to equalize the pressure, or the, excuse me, to equalize the concentration on both sides. So essentially you can think of the water as kind of trying to dilute the side that's more concentrated, so they're more similar in concentration. By trying to equalize the concentration, um, there, has, there creates a pressure differential between both sides of the semi-permeable membrane. And this pressure differential is called osmotic pressure. So we can calculate the osmotic pressure on either side of a semi-permeable membrane using a similar formula. There's one real key difference. Okay, so this pi, that's kind of a bad symbol for pi there, but the regular pi symbol stands for osmotic pressure. And what that is equal to is I, the Van Hoff factor, same type of consideration we've done before. Now, capital M, molarity. Key difference. R, the gas constant, is proportionality constant. And temperature in Kelvin. Right, so the reason we can use molarity for osmotic pressure is we're not working around extreme temperatures, right? So we don't, we don't have to worry about the molarity changing. So molarity is, is commonly used for this. So here's a real uh, easy example. What concentration of glucose? Now realize, right, the molarity is concentration. So they're asking for molarity. What is the molarity of a solution of glucose that is used um, in an IV bag that they hang, if you've ever been in the hospital or seen some in the hospital? So this is kind of cool, but they're asking what the concentration should be in that IV bag of sucrose because they want to match the osmotic pressure of the blood in the person who's going to get the IV bag. So here's the osmotic pressure of blood, and 37 degrees Celsius is our body temperature, 98.5, 98.6. Point <laughs> anyway, that's what 37 degrees Celsius is, just human body temperature. And um, so you can just rearrange the formula for osmotic pressure to solve for concentration or molarity. So molarity would be osmotic pressure divided by I, divided by R and T. Now, um, a couple things just to point out, I, Remember, the Van Hoff factor is one for all, 
covalently bonded with compounds. So that's covalent. So we can kind of just take I out of the factor. It's just equal to one. Make sure that T is in Kelvin. And just as importantly, make sure you use or that all of your units match the R value. Now, since we're talking about osmotic pressure here, um, the R value you use is, is the one that you're used to using for the most part, 0.08206 liters atmosphere mole Kelvin, okay, which means that um, you just match those units to everything else. So in this case, then the molarity of sucrose that is needed is 0.301. Oh, it's glucose, not sucrose, sorry. And just as a summary, here are the three formulas. And I also wanted to point out, um, I, I oversimplified the Van Hoff factor, um, which is probably what you're more likely to encounter. In other words, simply count the number of individual ions that are in an ionic compound to get an estimate of the Van Hoff factor. But in actuality, they are not usually evenly whole numbers like I'm doing. There's modifying complicating effects, which you don't won't have to calculate and figure out yourself. However, I didn't want you to get thrown off if you're asked a question and instead of just giving you, okay, well, the solute's sodium chloride, and then you would have to figure out or estimate, okay, I know sodium chloride has two particles, two ions, so I is two. In actuality, with more sophisticated means of calculating and measuring, the I value for sodium chloride is actually 1.9. So that's not something you have to worry about unless the problem tells you use an I value of 1.9 for sodium chloride. Then, of course, use that. But I didn't want that to throw you off if you do see that, okay? And that is it for colligative properties. That's it for Chapter 11, and that's it for this unit.